very good evening everybody welcome to the new episode of retina roundup myself dr hemantar fellowship in vitro retina and ocular oncology today i will be taking you through the top 6 articles of the last month firstly coming to the first article that is intraoperative closure of large full thickness macula holes with perfluoro carbon liquid the purpose was to evaluate the role of perfluoro carbon liquid and the passive extrusion for the management of large full thickness macula holes coming to the methods a standard pass plana vitrectomy with induction of posterior vitreous detachment was done for all the patients after internal limiting membrane peeling a bubble of uh, pfcl was injected over the posterior pole and passive extrusion of fluid was done with a back flush instrument below the pfcl bubble without touching the full thickness macula hole edges until the full thickness macula hole center was reached intraoperatively oct was done which showed the formation of a inner retina roof in all the cases and then confirmed the intraoperative full thickness macula hole closure complete pfcl removal was done after the fluid air exchange and gas was utilized in all the cases coming to the results preoperatively full thickness macula hole mean aperture size was 761 micrometer and standard deviation was 100 micrometer full thickness macula hole closure was achieved in all the eyes and visualized intraoperatively with oct so they concluded that full thickness macula hole closure can be achieved intraoperatively with the use of pfcl and passive extrusion the described surgical technique could be a valid alternative for the repair of large full thickness macula holes then coming to the second article that is oral surcement to reduce the risk of proliferative vitreo retinopathy following regmatogenous retinal detachment repair the purpose was to evaluate the outcomes of the patients who underwent regmatogenous retinal detachment repair were who were started on oral surcement for proliferative vitreo retinopathy prevention coming to the methods it was a retrospective observational case series of eyes of the patients undergoing high risk regmatogenous retinal detachment repair that were started on surcement post operatively the recommended dosing was 500 mg twice daily for one month followed by 500 mg daily for next 60 days the primary outcomes were the recurrent pvr related retinal detachment within 6 months and single surgery retinal reattachment rate the secondary outcomes included erm formation visual acuity and surcement safety profile coming to the results 32 eyes of 31 patients met the study inclusion criteria post operatively two eyes developed a pvr related redetachment that was 6.3% and two eyes redetached due to new breaks without any pvr overall single surgery retina reattachment rate was 87.5 percentage single surgery retina reattachment rate without silicone oil was 92.6% of the 12 eyes with grade c pvr related retinal detachment the single surgery retinal reattachment rate was 91.7 percentage post operatively seven eyes developed a erm of which three underwent erm removal surgery no patient had gastrointestinal upset or anemia hence they concluded that this proof of, this proof of concept clinical study suggests that oral surgery is well tolerated and warrants further investigation for its potential to reduce the risk of pvr after rrd repair in eyes at higher risk of developing pvr then coming to the third article for today which is rb1 circulating tumor dna the blood of retinoblastoma patients increases in untreated cases so the purpose was that the circulating tumor dna in the plasma has been identified in many of the cancers including retinoblastoma a diagnosis as well it's been previously shown that with treatment all the circulating tumor dna disappears and if there is a persistent plasma circulating tumor dna after treatment metastasis would develop the purpose of the study was mainly to determine how the circulating tumor dna variant allele frequency changes in the patients with retinoblastoma who have delayed the treatment so the methods were circulating tumor dna rb1 was detected and variant allele frequency was measured at the time of diagnosis and again prior to any intervention at some time later ranging from 2 to 28 days coming to the results four patients with five circulating tumor dna rb1 mutations were detected at diagnosis and variant allele frequency was increased on reevaluation of the same rb1 mutations in circulating tumor dna 
Hence, they concluded that in this small cohort, every patient that is 4 and every RP1 mutation that is 5 plasma level variant allele frequency percentage increased when measured at two different time points before the treatment was instituted, suggesting that growing tumors demonstrate increasing plasma circulating tumor DNA. Then coming to the fourth article for today, that is transcorneal vitrectomy in eyes with regressed retinoblastoma. Purpose, the current treatments for retinoblastoma facilitate lobe salvage but can also result in various vitroretinal disorders that may require further surgery. There is again controversy on surgical approaches in eyes with retinoblastoma. Here we describe a transcorneal vitrectomy approach that avoids the use of chemotherapy or cryotherapy. Methods, it was a retrospective chart review which was performed on five consecutive patients with regressed retinoblastoma for more than 12 months, that is group D, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles who had vitrectomy between November 2022 and December 2023. Coming to the results, five patients underwent eight vitrectomies for various indications including IOL fibrosis, vitreous hemorrhage, cataract, retinal detachment and silicone oil removal. Mean age at first vitrectomy was 6.2 years. Mean time from last retinoblastoma treatment was 50.4 months. Here the surgical method was radially oriented corneal incisions were made with a 23 gauge or 25 gauge TOCA system and the Versa HD lens oculus was utilized with the recite size for top down visualization. Neither chemotherapy nor cryotherapy were utilized. Wounds were sutured parallel to the limbus with 10 O polygalactin and a final water rinse was done to lyse any of the potential retinoblastoma cells. Surgical objectives were achieved, vision remained stable and no retinoblastoma spread was noted with a mean follow-up of up to 7.6 months. Hence, they concluded that this vitrectomy technique for eyes with regress retinoblastoma permits top-down viewing with Versa HD lens. Radial placement of corneal wounds avoids suturing through the uveal tract as well and a post-surgical water lens lyses any of the viable retinoblastoma cells. This approach may obviate the need for chemotherapy or cryotherapy as well. Then coming to the fifth article for today, that is effect of active HF on early stage post vitrectomy macular edema in the patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The purpose was to investigate the effectiveness of active HF on post vitrectomy macular edema and determine the risk factors for post vitrectomy macular edema recovery. This was a retrospective study which included 179 eyes of 179 patients who underwent paspana vitrectomy for proliferative diabetic retinopathy and developed post vitrectomy macular edema within three months after surgery. Eyes were grouped according to post-operative anti of treatment. Coming to the results, the central retinal thickness decreased significantly from baseline to three month follow-up in groups with or without post-operative anti of treatment. Thus, corrected visual acuity did not differ between the two groups during the follow-up. In the groups not receiving anti of BCVA was significantly improved at 1, 2 and 3 months. While in the anti of receiving group, BCVA was significantly improved at 1 and 3 months. So, they concluded that post vitrectomy macular edema tends to spontaneously resolve in the early post-operative period. The effect of anti of treatment in the first 3 months after diagnosis appears to be limited. Then coming to the last article for today, that is similar risk of kidney failure among patients with blinding diseases who receive anabizumab, aflibercept and bevacizumab, an observational health data sciences and informatics network study. The purpose was to characterize the incidence of kidney failure associated with intravital antibiotic of exposure and compare the risk of kidney failure in the patients treated with anabizumab, aflibercept or bevacizumab. This was a retrospective cohort study across the 12 databases in the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics Network. Subjects aged more than 18 years with more than 3 monthly intravital anti of medications for a blinding disease like diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, X-ray age-related macular degeneration or retinal vein occlusion were included. Coming to the methods, the standardized incidence proportions and rate of kidney failure while on treatment with anti were estimated. For each comparison, example, aflibercept versus ranibizumab, the patients from each groups were matched in the ratio of 1 is to 1 using the propensity scores. Then, 
Cox proportional hazards models were used to estimate the risk of kidney failure while on treatment. The main outcome measures were incidence of kidney failure while on antivage of treatment and the time from cohort entry to the kidney failure. Results of the 6.1 million patients with the blinding diseases, 37,189 who received map, 39,447 received aflipercept and 1,63,611 received bevacizumab were included. The total treatment exposure time was 1,61,724 person years. The average standardized incidence proportion of kidney failure was 6.78 per 1 lakh persons and the incidence rate of 7.42 per 1 lakh person years. The meta-analysis of kidney failure comparing aflipercept with ranibizumab was 1.01 0 0.7 with ranibizumab, with bevacizumab it was 0 0.95 and the aflipercept with bevacizumab was 0 0.95. So they concluded that there was no substantially different relative risk of kidney failure between those who receive ranibizumab, bevacizumab or aflipercept. Practicing ophthalmologists and nephrologists should be aware of the risk of kidney failure among patients receiving intravital antivage of treatment and that there is little empirical evidence to preferentially choose among the specific intravital antivage of treatment. That's it for today. Thank you for your patient listening.